Number 10, freshly hatched spiders. Yeah, this is one of the worst ones out there if you're asking me. It comes to us from one of my all time favorite spooky Marvel stories, which is featured in Edge of Spider Verse, issue number four, the previous Edge of Spider Verse, not the newest one to come out. And the story that we're talking about here is that of Patton Parnell. I love Patton Parnell. Patton Parnell is an alternate version of Peter Parker who is basically a psychotic serial killer in the making. Once he is transformed by a radioactive spider bite, he gains more more confidence and literally turns into a monster. He gets revenge on his uncle Ted who has mistreated him throughout the years by placing spider eggs inside of him. Yikes! And well, those eggs hatch. Uncle Ted isn't the only one who seemingly meets his end this way either. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not smash that subscribe button? I know there's some of you out there, some of you that aren't subscribed, probably not you. You folks that are commenting, I know you've probably subscribed, but the you over there, yeah, you should subscribe. Number nine, lights, camera, fire. I feel like so many of these are going to come from Punisher comics because honestly, it's one of the darkest characters we have over at Marvel. And he has also had his own Max series, which was basically all about living on the edge when it came to more graphic subject matter. So if you want some of the worst ways, that's where you're gonna go. You're gonna go to Punisher Max. Case in point, in issue number 30 of Punisher Max, when Frank is in the midst of hunting down those who own an operation that treats people as though they were mere objects. It's a thing I can't say on this platform, but I think you know what I'm talking about here. It's that kind of operation where you're treating people like they're not people. One of the worst things a person can do in terms of business and one of the most powerful motivations in comics for heroes, or rather anti-heroes, to seriously mess up some bad guys, which is exactly what Frank does to the men involved who are stationed in America. And woman. The older man, Tiberiu, Punisher captures and lights up, recording his demise on film as a warning to be delivered to those in Moldova. Number 8. Strung up like a Christmas decoration. This is going to be an interesting one to try and describe here. Whew, I do not envy myself in this moment. This demise also comes from the Punisher Max issue. Same story but an earlier issue. Here in issue 28 of the series, before he gets to the head of the operation, Frank deals with his son, Chris do, attempting to get information from him on his father, Tibiru, and their associate, Vera. He attempts to get him to talk by seemingly numbing him and using his organs as basically decorations for a tree. I don't know of Chris do's fate, but I can't imagine it ended well for him, knowing how Frank usually deals with criminals. In fact, I'm pretty sure everyone has assumed, based on other things that are mentioned or just in general, based on Frank's nature, that Chris do does not make it. Number 7. Crushed by Tumors Of course, when it comes to some of the worst ways to go, it doesn't get more gruesome and depressing than ruins. Every time I think I've escaped this alternate reality and my mind is free from it, there's always another list that brings me back. Back to Marvel Ruins. In Marvel Ruins, one of the worst ways I've seen to go is the way of the Hulk. In this reality, superpowers are depicted as being brutally realistic, so when Bruce Banner becomes irradiated, instead of turning into, you know, his giant, muscular, and vibrantly green, all Alter Ego, the Hulk. He just develops a bunch of green tumors that become so large that they basically crush him beneath their weight. Number 6. Death off panel, but then also cannibalism? Janet Van Dyne's death in the Ultimate Universe has to be one of the worst. First of all, we don't even show her enough respect to give her a death on panel, as she drowns during the tidal wave in Ultimatum, one of the many poor victims who die off panel despite deserving an on death panel, especially considering Janet at the time was the leader of the Ultimates, so there's also that. But then, but then, she also gets eaten by the blob for some reason. It's also weird that they decided to make the blob do this. I mean, the use of people eating people in Ultimates is just weird in general. I know, I know the blob is a bad guy as well, but he isn't typically known to be like a cannibal anywhere ever. Feels like some weird and extremely gross sizeism to me. Number five, steamrolled. Well, this one did not kill the person who was victim to it. It would kill most other people and is still one of the worst ways I can think of to die that I've seen on display in the Marvel Universe. This 
death, not really a death, but you know, could be, comes to us from the pages of Punisher issue number 17, part of the Marvel Knights line, written by Garth Ennis. It seems oddly slow and terrible, a properly terrifying way to go. Yep, we're talking about when Punisher has Wolverine steamrolled. This also happens after Wolverine has already suffered a ton of other awful stuff, losing the skin on his face, getting shot point blank below the belt, and having suffered an attempt at removing his legs with a chainsaw. While he obviously lives past being steamrolled thanks to his healing factor, Wolverine has heightened senses, so he would also feel immense pain with every single inch that the steamroller rolls over him. And he actually goes feet first underneath it. Yikes. Number 4. Shatterproof Glass So this is one of those things where the actual story behind it makes it a heck of a lot worse. And also more poetic in some ways. Once again, we're going to Punisher Max, and once again, we're going to the same story that I was talking about earlier with the insidious operation that Punisher attempts to put a stop to, helping to free the women who find themselves basically trapped within it. However, not all the women involved in this operation are actually victims. One of them is actually a crucial part of running the business, and even suggests how to best break the women they are holding and using so they can be more easily used and manipulated. More malleable. When Frank runs into her, he knows her involvement and decides to dole out a pretty awful punishment. Death by being tossed repeatedly into shatterproof glass, which eventually does give out with the woman, Vera, falling to her doom. I think it's the moments in between being tossed against the glass brutally that really make me feel this is one of the worst ways to go. Those pauses in between, I'm like, oh, cause you know what's coming and you have like no control. I don't like that. That's, I don't like it. Number 3. Sinking with your best pal Possibly one of the worst ways I can imagine going just in general. Whether we're talking about comic books or real life, this way is pretty bad. Even just based on the circumstances here, the way that Captain Kate Pride went is just really sad too. She went down with a ship, drowned, which many have said is actually one of the most painful ways to go. And what made her death even worse was that she believed one of her best friends, her pal Lockheed, also perished with her. This happened when Sebastian Shaw attempted to remove Kate from the Hellfire Trading Company, which she sat on the board of as their Red Queen by, well, I mean drowning her, killing her. You know. Number 2. Starvation and Isolation This one comes to us from Magneto, who saw this as a fair punishment to dole out to Red Skull, based on his treatment of other humans during World War II when he was obviously allied with Germany in the Third Reich. Magneto in essence took Red Skull to an isolated underground bunker, leaving him trapped there without any way out as the door was locked and located on the roof of the bunker. Red Skull was left with no ladder and only some water to basically keep him company, which he'd have to ration in order to prolong his survival. Although, obviously Obviously, I don't think Magneto really intended him to survive survive. During his time trapped here, he began to hallucinate and started to lose his mind as starvation set in. I think this is possibly one of the worst ways to go in general, so once again, Magneto takes one of our top spots. Basically, don't don't upset Magneto. Just don't do that. Number one, Carnage. I'd like to thank Fireball Earth for this terrifying and very true suggestion. So thank you from the comments. This is such a good point. Carnage is so frightening. Carnage is definitely one of the worst ways to go in the Marvel Universe. With Carnage, you not only have to deal with having your life ended by a symbiote, which honestly, like I said, is terrifying enough, but you also have to deal with Cletus Cassidy, who is the other part of Carnage. Carnage is one entity made up of two, serial killer Cletus Cassidy. Cassidy and his soulmate, the alien symbiote offspring of Venom, who we often name Carnage, but technically Carnage is the entity of both of them together. Anyways, this symbiote is actually Venom's first child, who quickly became known as one of the most cruel and deadly out there, largely due to their connection to Cletus. I've seen what Carnage does when he has a whole town full of people to play with in Carnage USA, when the villain took control of an entire town, and it is definitely not pretty. Hands down, it's one of the most frightening Carnage stories I've ever read. So I would not want to be part of that at all. No thank you. Number 10. Trying to save the day and blowing your head off. Not all superhero teams are created equal. A prime example of this is Section 8, who are possibly the worst team on the DC roster. They have members such as Six Pack, who's just an alcoholic who attacks people with a broken beer bottle, Dog Welder, who welds the bodies of dead dogs to his enemies' faces, and perhaps most useless of all, Friendly Fire. Friendly Fire has the ability to shoot powerful energy blasts out of his hands that deal devastating damage. 
Unfortunately, as his name suggests, he is totally incapable of hitting what he's aiming at, and instead always ends up hitting his teammates. This has led to the deaths of a couple Section 8 members, but the worst death has got to be the one that occurred when the team went up against the mini angled ones. These strange visitors attacked the team, easily dispatching team members like Jean de Baton Baton and Dog Welder. Friendly Fire realized it was up to him and he had to come through for his friends. As he put it, I gotta do it. Just this once. Gotta hit what I'm aiming at. I can't let my buddies down. Must hold the power! He unleashed the full force of his blast and blew his own head off, barely being able to utter the word crap before dying. This is a bad death, but it also may be one of the most embarrassing ones you could possibly have. Number 9. Death by Psychic Squid In Alan Moore's Watchmen, Earth is on the verge of atomic war with the doomsday clock ticking ever closer to the end of the world. In an effort to try and bring the world together with a common enemy, the smartest man on the planet, Ozymandias, puts a plan in motion to ensure a ceasefire between the states and the Soviets. He has a massive psychic squid engineered, and then he teleports it into the middle of New York City. It gives off a psychic pulse that causes the horrible deaths of half of the city. In the beginning of issue 12, we see the result of this, and the streets are littered with terrified looking bodies of people whose last moments were filled with nothing but pain and horror. Having been declared acceptable losses in Ozymandias' unilaterally enacted plan to try and save the Earth. It's not the kind of end that anyone wants for themselves, and the cynical calculation of their lives being worth losing makes it even worse. In follow-up stories set in the Watchmen universe, which really shouldn't have been made, but whatever, we learn that this false flag alien attack was discovered by the general populace not long after, making all these deaths utterly meaningless. Number 8. Gorilla Grodd Gorilla Grodd is a Flash villain who, as his name would suggest, is a gorilla. He is the king of a race of super intelligent gorillas who live in Gorilla City, and of course he hates humanity. He is a formidable foe, having telepathic powers that make him extremely dangerous. Beyond that, he's also a 600 pound gorilla. He is an extremely brutal character, and I don't really have much to say about him, other than the fact that I think getting beaten to death by an angry 600 pound gorilla would be a really terrible way to die. Nuff said. Number 7. Getting Drained by Parasite Rudy Jones was a relatively normal man, until he won a tour of a LexCorp facility. While there, he dropped a donut on the floor and decided to eat it anyway, citing the five second rule. Unfortunately, the donut had landed in a bit of toxic waste and it affected Rudy, transforming him into a pink monster called the Parasite. The Parasite is always hungry and will do anything to try and satiate his hunger. When he goes up against Superman, he drains the Man of Steel's powers and grows stronger, but Superman isn't the only person he will go after. When the Parasite feeds on a normal civilian, like you or me, he grabs them and drains their life force. This causes his victim to shrivel up and die, leaving nothing behind but a withered corpse. Now, coming across any supervillain would be a horrible experience, but being grabbed by a monster who painfully drains away the remaining life in your body as you watch yourself shrivel up until you finally die is not how I want to go. I want to die in a tragic hammock accident. Number 6. Joker Venom. If you were to live in Gotham City, the last person you would want to cross paths with is the Ace of Knaves, the Clown Prince of Crime, the Harlequin of Hate, the Joker. Joker is a total psycho who has absolutely no reverence for human life, often claiming his victims' lives in terrible and painful ways. He's had some brutal kills that were relatively one-off in method, like skinning a man alive in one book, but he typically saves these kinds of deaths for henchmen that have crossed him. If you are a normal civilian coming across Joker, your most likely cause of death will be either getting shot or being poisoned with Joker Venom. Joker Venom is a special chemical that Joker developed which causes the victim to go into uncontrollable spasms of laughter which will cause asphyxiation. While this is happening, you would experience vivid hallucinations and madness as the muscles in your face contract into a horrible rictus grin, giving you a resemblance to the man who ended your life. Number 5. 
getting eaten. There are a lot of horrible ways to die while living in the DC Universe. It seems like no matter where you go, whether it be Gotham, Metropolis, or Keystone City, every other day there is some kind of supervillain attack that is going to result in a massive loss of life until the local superhero manages to stop it. One of the surprisingly common things you would have to worry about as a civilian in the DC Universe is how many of these supervillains want to eat you. Off the top of my head, there is Yurd the Unknown, who is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but also a giant crocodile. He posed as a hero for a time to join the Black Marvel family before betraying the team and eating Black Adam's sidekick. That's right, that annoying kid who is following the rock around in the Black Adam movie? Yeah, in the comics he gets eaten by a giant crocodile. And then there's King Shark, who is of course a massive humanoid shark who will often eat his prey. Then there's Killer Croc, who is a human who has a skin condition that makes him look like a crocodile, who is also known for eating people. Now, getting eaten by a monster would suck, but if you were eaten by a giant monster who was like a leviathan, then it would be over in like one bite. But these guys, although so large that you couldn't hope to fight back, aren't quite large enough to end your suffering in one chomp, and it would likely take a few very painful and very sharp bites before you bit the dust. Number four turning into a Dolatron. Another Gotham rogue you wouldn't want to come across is Laszlo Valentine, otherwise known as Professor Pig. Pig is trying to achieve human perfection by kidnapping people and turning them into mindless and identical minions who he calls Dolatrons. The method of this is by burning a mask onto your face, which you could never remove, and then using surgical tools to put you through so much unimaginable pain that the trauma causes you to forget your identity and be simply a mindless doll who does Professor Pig's bidding. You may be thinking, oh, Andrew, they're not dead. Why are they on this list? Well, they have no trace of their prior identities remaining, and they have no thoughts or feelings of their own. For all intents and purposes, they're dead. And plus, it is not uncommon for Pig to send his Dolatrons to their deaths for the cause. So if you want to be really specific, this entry could be getting turned into a Dolatron who then blows themselves up. Number three, getting injected by the Scarecrow. Dr. Jonathan Crane is a Batman villain who has managed to come up with a chemical that causes those who ingest it to experience their greatest fears. When given the toxin in a gaseous form, the victim will have a really bad trip, seeing hallucinations that correspond with their fears. So if the person is scared of snakes, they will see that. However, Scarecrow also has a strain of his toxin, which is much more powerful that he doesn't typically use. When the toxin is injected into the victim, they will experience the same unfathomable level of terror, slowly losing their minds until their heart eventually gives out, causing them to scare themselves to death. This is a rough way to go, because you are dealing with the horror of being at the mercy of the Scarecrow, as well as the fear of death, and having to deal with your deepest, darkest fear at the same time. Ah! Commitment! Number two, getting captured by the Black Mask. When thinking about DC villains you wouldn't want to be stuck with, you might think the answer is Joker or Darkseid, but they, although cruel, usually dispatch their victims pretty quickly, all things considered. No, the villain you really have to hope you don't end up at the mercy of is Roman Sionis, aka the Black Mask. He is not above taking someone out with a simple headshot, but God help you if you come across him on a day where he has some time to kill. He is an expert at advanced interrogation techniques, being able to get even the most strong-willed person to talk after subjecting them to extreme pain, such as when he captured Spoiler near the end of the Batman War Games arc. Even if you don't have information he needs, you might end up in a sticky situation with the mask, as he has a room designed exclusively for his horrible hobby where he practices on random people just for fun. So that would be a pretty bad way to die. Number one, Prey of the Hunters 3. In Animal Man Volume 2, Animal Man is dealing with his daughter Maxine's new powers and her connection to the Red, force that connects all animal life in the universe. Animal Man has a strange map show up on his body, which will lead them to the Red, and he and his daughter set out to find it. Going after them are the villainous Hunters 3, who are essentially eldritch creatures from another dimension. They hide in plain sight by feeding on people that they come across. They slurp out your insides, 
leaving nothing but your skin, which they then get inside and walk around in. The disguise doesn't last very long before they look absolutely terrifying, with tentacles and pincers popping out of your now deformed skin. It's a rough way to go, and the knowledge that you are now a host to an evil creature who is desecrating your corpse makes it my pick for the worst way to die in the DC universe. Number 10. Kingpin's Mutant Prison Some of the worst fates really do come from ruins, where it feels like everything is just awful for the sake of being awful, I guess. I mean, this series was made to sort of contrast the Marvels, and it does that admittedly, but it does that without really having anything else to say, it kind of feels like. When it comes to Quicksilver, he's seemingly still alive in this series, but honestly, I can't imagine for much longer, which is how he's kind of making my list here. He ends up having his legs and arms removed because he's too fast, likely. However, Kingpin, his jailer, here claims that this is actually done for, and I quote, Quickie's own good, considering that it looks like it wasn't done very well, and that it looks like Quicksilver may even still be bleeding, possibly bleeding out at this point. I can't imagine he'll last too much longer, and honestly, what a terrible way to go. Honestly, just existing in ruins I feel like is a pretty terrible way to go, because if you exist in that world, you're probably already dead, or you're like on your way to dying. I mean, even the protagonist, the narrator we follow on this journey, Phil Sheldon is, so yeah. And he's like the protagonist, so. Or at least the narrator. I would say he's still the protagonist. He's still kind of the character we follow. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love when we talk about pretty bleak things, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button. Number 9, Invisible Woman. Marvel Zombies really does have some of the most gruesome deaths, which is why I would never want to go there myself. This one at least was kind of going to a person that deserved it though, although I feel bad about saying that because I really do love this character, so like, it's still sad that this happens in this reality. We are talking here about She-Hulk's death. I do love She-Hulk, although in this instance, She-Hulk was already zombified and it kinda ate the kids of Susan Storm, aka AKA Invisible Woman and Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic in this universe. Valeria and Franklin. Weird thing is, you'd think Franklin would have been able to like fend her off with his reality warping powers, which I assumed he would also have in this universe, but hey, maybe on Earth 2149 Franklin didn't have powers, or you know, he was depowered prematurely. Either way, when Susan finds out that She-Hulk as a zombie has used her knowledge of the Baxter Building Codes as someone who was once part of the Fantastic Four team to get in and then devour these two. She loses it and uses her power to create a force field and basically pop She-Hulk's head like a grape. It's insane to me how powerful Sue is. I mean, I guess at least it'd be quick. But yeah, Susan Storm's pretty wild. I would not want to be messed with by Susan Storm. Don't make her upset. Number eight, driven mad by power. Another awful way to die, of course, coming to us from ruins, is the fate of Silver Surfer. Silver Surfer dies as a result of what they believe to be a sort of superhero madness. In essence, it's believed that Silver Surfer missed the feeling of breathing air for some reason, being unable to as he was, you know, traveling in the vacuum of space without, of course, needing to breathe. However, this was the very time when he decided, hey, you know what? I'd love to breathe right now, even though there's no air around me. Not a great time considering, yeah, there's no oxygen there, you're just floating around in the space between stars and planets. However, Silver Surfer is believed to have basically torn himself apart, clawing at himself until his lungs were exposed, and of course, despite having the power cosmic, he died. It's believed he died from the shock of the cold. I mean, honestly? What a way to go. Become so crazed that you think tearing yourself apart so you can breathe while flying alone in outer space on a silver surfboard is a good idea or is simply something you must do. I can't imagine that. Also, I love how it's like, I gotta breathe, like time to rip myself apart. Okay then. Number seven, Squip Grub Chulp. What does that mean? You're about to find out. Symbiotes are definitely some of the most frightening creatures we have in the Marvel Universe. Definitely would not want to be rescued by one. Sorry, Venom. But also would never want to be dubbed a criminal by one. For years, Venom had been threatening to eat people's brains. And guess what? It also became more than a threat at one point. Venom threatened to do this because the symbiote actually feeds on the happy chemicals that brains produce. So either it needs a host with a good supply of that, or one that basically snacks on chocolate a lot, which is why Eddie usually does that. Otherwise, it would literally have to find some brains to eat because it needs those chemicals, baby. Now, I'm pretty sure Venom has moved past this requirement in the modern day of comics right now, but it doesn't stop it from being a deeply disturbing thing that the symbiote did slash needed to do to survive at one point. Also, for anyone who was wondering, the name of this point is the sounds that Venom made when, you know, scarfing down some brains. So, ugh. Number six, microwaved. 
This one makes me very uncomfortable, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyways because that's my job, so that's what I gotta do right now. Even though, of course, it's in a Deadpool story, which I think is the only place you could get away with something like this at Marvel Comics. In the comic Deadpool Kills Deadpool, we head to the multiverse where Deadpool, a version of Deadpool anyways, is hunting down, well, other Deadpools. Like the title says, Deadpool kills Deadpool. That's what's happening here. Right at the beginning of the series in issue number one, the sinister black suited Deadpool ends up confronting his alternate zombified self, Headpool, who is of course also known as Deadpool though, but we're gonna call him Headpool for clarity's sake. Headpool hails from the Marvel zombie universe of Earth 2149, where the world was ravaged by zombies. This zombie though ended up making his way to Earth 616 before he was reduced to just being a head. So how does the evil Deadpool deal with him pretty easily and terribly by popping him in a microwave. Splat! Number 5. Devoured by Spiders What a way to go. I just love spooky, scary Spider-Man stories. And this one comes from another tale based in the Spider-Man multiverse. We are talking about the fate of Spider's Man. Spider's Man is like Spider-Man, but this Peter Parker, instead of becoming a man with spider-like powers, basically became spiders. Peter Parker in this case fell into a vat of experimental spiders who devoured him completely. However, because science, they also ended up taking on his consciousness, which survived his physical death with the spiders becoming kind of like a new version of that character. Character, the hero Spider's Man, who is entirely made up of spiders, and who also kind of goes on to become a villain, but that's a story for another time. Now, I personally am not too bothered by spiders in my everyday life, but I also feel like I've never dealt with, you know, a whole vat of hungry spiders who wanted to eat me. So, on paper, this one remains pretty terrifying to me, even though I'm usually pretty cool with spiders. Number four, the media revenge. On our part one, we talked about the tragic and disrespectful death of Janet Van Dyne in the Ultimate Universe, aka the Wasp, but at least at least we can say she was avenged. Or we could say that if this avenging wasn't so terrible. I don't know if we can quite say that because it's pretty terrible what happens here. When Hank Pym, aka Giant Man, aka Ant Man, finds out that not only is Janet dead, but that the blob also desecrated her corpse by, you know, well, eating her, he decides to get revenge by doing the same to Blob. But while he is still alive, because ultimate universe, <laughs> Hank grows to his giant size and then picks Blob up and basically bites off his head. Although at least I guess he doesn't eat him. He instead, you know, spits Blob's head out. But still, the whole scene is not saved from being insanely awful, I'd say. And this is still not a way that I personally would want to go. Honestly, facing a giant being just seems like a bad way to go in general. I don't like that idea. I don't like things that are gigantic. It makes me uncomfortable. If you're not eaten, you're still likely getting squashed. And that's just a yikes to me. I don't want someone to step on me. That's no thank you. Number three, slowly consumed. Yeesh! This is probably one of the worst ones I've ever seen or read. I mean, all of these are really bad, but this one haunts me. This one haunts me to this day. When I think about it from a psychological perspective, well, I can't really fully do that because it just messes up my mind too much. So I can't really do it, but you get the idea. Basically, during Marvel Zombies, which happens in an alternate reality, where most of the heroes and villains succumb to the virus, but not all of them, one of the people that manages to survive for a good long while is actually T'Challa, aka Black Panther. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that he gets out of the story unscathed, although he does not become a zombie for a very long time. At one point, he is lured into a trap and basically kept as a food source by Hank Pym, aka Ant-Man, or rather Giant Man, who prolongs his friend's death in order to keep the meat fresh so that he might slowly consume him. Don't worry, Black Panther does manage to escape. He doesn't die this way, but not every single piece of him makes it. And there are others in Marvel Zombies like Mary Jane and Aunt May who actually do die by being consumed by someone they loved and trusted, Spider-Man. So, huh, yeah. Number two, stomach problems. Ugh. Okay, time to talk about Old Man Logan and his fight against Old Man Hulk. If you are familiar with the Old Man Logan universe and the stories that exist within it, I think you know where we're headed. For those of you who aren't, get ready and allow me to explain. Basically, in the Old Man Logan universe, the whole world is left in an apocalyptic state after the supervillains finally win and actually defeat the heroes. Success! Wolverine himself was manipulated into turning on his fellow X-Men by Mysterio, and now is only known as Logan. He doesn't like to go by Wolverine anymore, he doesn't like to think of that because 
because it ended terribly. However, despite all of this and everything he has lived through, Logan still manages to find a way to keep moving and even ends up settling down and starting a family. However, he has to pay money to the Hulk gang, who basically have claimed the land that he and his family live on. Logan ventures out to get said money to like basically pay his weird Hulk landlords and actually succeeds in collecting the money, but arrives home too late as the impatient Hulks returned early and actually murdered his kin. Seeking revenge, Logan challenges Pappy Banner, the head of the Hulk gang. Logan seems to lose the fight when Hulk eats him, but later on, Hulk dies of indigestion. That's what happens when you eat Wolverine. Number 1. Magneto I think simply facing Magneto would be one of the worst ways to go. He is not a man I would ever want to come up against. I've seen him torment people by pulling all the metal out of their blood, pull off Wolverine's adamantium coating from his skeleton through his skin, and torment and kill a woman with a paperclip. And let's not forget that Magneto at his most skilled and powerful can actually just control blood flow in your body and your brain, basically taking control of your mind or just preventing oxygen from getting to your brain, thereby basically suffocating you in a really terrible way. He is basically one of the most frightening people that the Marvel Universe has to offer, and being killed by him for whatever offense he deems worthy of death, I imagine, would just be downright terrible, no matter what it was. Magneto isn't usually one known for doling out quick and painless punishments or deaths, so yeah. Number 10. Reverse Flash Brain Scramble Reverse Flash is one of the most brutal villains in the DC Universe, with his unhinged psychopathy prompting him to end people's lives in incredibly disturbing ways, sometimes going back in time to prevent people from ever having even been born, and other times using his incredible speed to turn himself into a lethal weapon. In the Flash TV show, we've seen him vibrate his hand and use it to stop people's hearts, but in the classic comics, he used a similar but slightly different method on the Flash's wife. Over the course of their many battles, the hatred between Reverse Flash and the Flash grew exponentially. But while this was occurring, Reverse Flash was also falling in love with Barry's wife. Iris. He came into their home when Barry was away and proposed to Iris, who said no, because she loved her husband, and also because Reverse Flash is a crazy psycho. Reverse Flash got his revenge by sneaking into a costume party where everyone was dressed as superheroes, and he murdered Iris, who was dressed as Batgirl, by vibrating his hand so that it could pass through her skull and scramble her brain. There are certainly more painful ways to go, but the speed of this death is what makes it's so bad. One moment you're at a party with your whole life ahead of you, and the next your brain has been torn apart at super speed and you're just gone. Number 9. Jason Todd's Death Jason Todd has had a pretty rough life. He was an orphan living on the streets before one fateful day he attempted to steal the tires off of the Batmobile in Crime Alley. Batman caught him in the act and decided that the best way to help the boy handle his rage was to give him an outlet, training him to be the second Robin after Dick Grayson left to become Nightwing. Things were looking up. Jason eventually discovered that his birth mother was still alive and set out to find her. He eventually found Dr. Sheila Haywood working in a refugee camp in Iran, but discovered that she was being blackmailed by the Joker into letting him steal important supplies. He offered to help his mother, revealing that he was the boy Wonder, and she led him to a warehouse. Once there, Jason realized that his mother had led him into a trap as she was embezzling hospital funds and felt that if Robin was allowed to live, her operation would be at risk. She turned him over to the Joker, who beat him nearly to death with a crowbar and then left him in the building which was rigged to explode. So Jason found his real mother, was almost immediately betrayed by her, beaten up by a homicidal clown, and then blown up. He eventually returned from the dead, but that doesn't change the fact that this was a rough way to go. Number 8. Gentleman Ghosts Unending Torment Jim Craddock was a highwayman in the 1800s who came to America from England and began being known as Gentleman Jim. He crossed paths with the famous gunslingers Nighthawk and Cinnamon, and although Jim was a criminal, Nighthawk mistakenly believed that he had committed a crime against his wife. As a result, Nighthawk executed Jim in cold blood. Jim came back as a ghost, doomed to wander the earth until he could get his revenge 
revenge and end the lives of his executioners. Unfortunately for the gentleman ghost, his executioners are one of the many reincarnations of Hawkman and Hawkgirl, who are always reborn anew whenever they die. Therefore, there is no way for Gentleman Ghost to fulfill his curse, and he is doomed to never enter the afterlife, having been a ghost for hundreds of years. Now, getting executed for a crime you didn't do is bad enough. Becoming a ghost who can't move on to the next life until he has revenge is worse. But finding out that the people you have to get revenge against are unable to stay dead, therefore making your entire curse unfulfillable, is a whole other level of awful. Number 7. Infected by the Carrier Appearing in the Batman Journey into Night miniseries from 2005, the Carrier is a villain who was infected with a deadly disease while searching for treasure in a cave. He survived, but as a result, he became deadly to anyone who so much as breathed the same air as him. Anyone who came into contact with him would begin going through painful contractions as they struggled to breathe and began forming large infected pustules and foaming green gunk out of their mouths. Carrier eventually discovered that he could prevent this by wearing a gas mask with reversed filters and set upon a quest for revenge against the man who sold him the bogus treasure map. Huge amounts of people died as a result of Carrier coming to Gotham, and the speed at which they were infected, symptomatic, and finally dead was a horrifying way for anyone unfortunate to cross paths with the Carrier to go. Number 6. Death by Rorschach. The characters featured in Alan Moore's Watchmen are extremely brutal with their enemies, with one of the most aggressive of the vigilantes being Walter Kovacs, aka Rorschach. Rorschach is known for ending the lives of his enemies in increasingly brutal ways. In the book, we are told one enemy got dropped down an elevator shaft. In a flashback, we see him handcuff a man in a burning house, giving him a hacksaw so he would spend his last moments trying to remove his own hand. And in Issue 8, Rorschach electrocutes a man and drowns another with a toilet. I think the most painful method that we see the character use in the story is in issue number 6, when he is in prison. One of the other prisoners approaches him in the cafeteria line, tries to use a shiv against the imprisoned vigilante. Rorschach responds by grabbing a tray of boiling oil and throwing it in the prisoner's face. The man is horrifically burned as Rorschach is dragged away, reminding the various prisoners that he isn't locked up with them. Them, they're locked up with him. The burned man spends days in the prison hospital in excruciating pain before he finally passes away from his injuries. Number 5. The U-Men The mutants of the Marvel Universe have had a pretty rough go of it, being subjected to many atrocities due to the prejudices of the humans that despise them. Usually the humans are convinced that the mutants are dangerous and desire their extermination so they can take their place as the next step in evolution, which makes the humans try to exterminate them first. Other comics explore how the mutant hate doesn't really make a lot of sense, as the humans will praise the superpowered beings until they find out that they're mutants, at which point they will turn against them. However, some of the humans hate the mutants out of sheer jealousy. For example, the Homo Perfectus movement, which are humans who believe that they are mutants stuck in human bodies and wish to undergo surgery to empower themselves with mutant powers. There was a cult-like faction of the group called the U-Men, who swore against ever having contact with the impure world until they had had their powers, and wore containment suits until they could be transformed. The way the U-Men went about this was by traveling the country and capturing mutants, who they would then harvest organs and body parts from in order to empower their members. Life for mutants is hard enough, but being captured by an insane cult with a military budget who want to dissect you and steal your body parts in a crazy quest to steal your powers is one of the worst, as it is a painful and demeaning way to go, as in the words of their leader, John Sublime, to them, mutants are just livestock. Number 4. Mr. Hyde plays Hide the Jekyll with the Invisible Man. Another Alan Moore series known for its dark themes and extreme violence is The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. In it, characters from classic literature come together to form a team. One of the members of the team is Holly Griffin otherwise known as the Invisible Man. He is a twisted monster of a man who uses his abilities to have his way with unsuspecting women, and in Volume 2 of the series, he takes his lack of morality to new levels. When Martians invade 
the Earth, he realizes that there is no way for humanity to win the War of the Worlds and decides to save his own skin by making a deal with the invaders to betray humanity in exchange for being allowed to rule the planet alongside them. He also attacks his teammate Mina Murray, thus earning the ire of another of his teammates, Edward Hyde. In the League universe, Edward Hyde is kind of similar to the Hulk, being incredibly strong and about three times his usual size. So, in issue 5 of volume 2, he decided to use his size to his advantage, beating and pinning down the Invisible Man. He then spent hours brutally, well, you know, over and over until the Invisible Man died. His remains becoming visible only once he had fully expired after hours of pain and humiliation at Hyde's hands. Number 3. Batman Who Laughs Super Brutal Murder When the Joker of Earth-22 found out that he was dying, he decided to go on one last spree in an attempt to send Batman over the edge. He took out all of the other supervillains in Gotham, as well as Jim Gordon. He blew up several buildings and captured Batman. He forced the Dark Knight to watch as he ended the lives of the parents of kidnapped children in front of them before infecting them with the Joker toxin. In order to stop the madness, Batman broke free and broke the Clown Prince's neck. When he did this, Batman was inadvertently exposed to a Joker toxin, which corrupted his mind and gave him the Joker's sick and twisted sense of humor and murderous desires. This Batman went on to kill the Bat family, as well as the entire Justice League, before using his his evil cunning to take over and destroy his world. His methods of taking out his former teammates were all awful, but the most despicable of them has to be how he took out Superman and his family. He brought Superman, his son John, and Lois Lane together, and then exposed Clark and John to black kryptonite. This particular strain of kryptonite drives Kryptonians insane, and as a result, Clark and John ripped Lois apart before attacking each other, as the Batman who laughs watched their cruel and messy demise. Number 2. Anything Involving the Spectre The spirit of vengeance in the DC Universe first appeared in More Fun Comics number 52. He was originally a demon named Aztar, who was helping Lucifer try and take control of heaven. He eventually had a change of heart and surrendered to the Archangel Michael. As a means of atonement, his memory and consciousness were wiped and he was transformed into the Spectre. He is divinely powered, being capable of almost anything he can imagine, can travel between dimensions, and can shoot energy blasts. He's immortal and capable of flight, intangibility, possession, telepathy, and telekinesis, just to name a few of his powers. In order to temper this power, he must be bonded to a human host, with this most often being Jim Corrigan. Spectre has no limit to his power, but is bound by the morality of his host, who often prevents him from unleashing the full wrath of God upon his enemies. He is known for subjecting his victims to fates worse than death, before eventually subjecting them to death as well. Over his years in the comics, he has used some strange and disturbing methods to dispatch his enemies, such as aging them to death, melting them, cutting them in half with a giant pair of scissors, turning a man into a sentient and feeling mannequin who is then dumped in a fire and painfully burnt, turning a bunch of junkies into his fingertips and then injecting them with liquid fire, or in one extreme case, burning down an entire country. Number 1. The Omega Sanction The villain Darkseid is perhaps the most evil being in the DC Universe, being a frequent foe of the Justice League. Sure, he might destroy you with his incredible strength, or even with the use of his Omega Beams, which are essentially deadly energy beams that always find their target, usually reducing the victim to ash. That's bad, but it could be worse. If Darkseid instead used the Omega Sanction. The Omega Sanction traps you in an endless series of lives, each one more painful and awful than the last. So, you don't just die a horrible death, you die horrible death after horrible death without respite forever. It doesn't get much worse than that. Number 10. Mark of Cain Of the most gruesome ways to go, I think one of the worst would be to get Mark of Cain. Cain marked? I, I don't know if that's really how we say that, but sure. We can say it either of those ways for now, because I don't know what else to call that. Kane Parker is a clone of Peter Parker, of the two main clones we know from the Clone Saga. He was the one who was actually more dramatic and broody. He had long hair and for a while was more of an antagonist, or at least believed to be so. Kane was also known for straight up killing. 
telling people the god in his way with his mark of Cain. What is the mark of Cain? While initially we kind of thought it was like its own ability, it's actually just Peter's like little hooks that he has on his hands which allow him to stick to stuff, which we actually see in the Raimi verse pretty close up. Cain would basically put his hand on someone's face and then turn on this sticky ability which resulted in him seemingly burning the face of his victim. I mean, I don't know if this would actually kill you, but I feel like if this was at all involved in the process of Cain killing me, I would not be interested in that at all. Unless I guess I was already dead. Then I guess I'd kind of be fine with it, because I'd be like, well, I'm not here to feel that, so cool. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe. I know there's a lot of you out there that aren't subscribed, and if you're already subscribed, let me know in the comments. Number 9, Man Thing. In 1971, Marvel introduced Man Thing. He was a scientist named Ted Salas trying to create his own version of the super soldier serum before being attacked by criminals who wanted to steal his work. To keep the formula secret, Ted injected himself with the serum before getting in a car accident that caused his car to crash into a magic swamp. The serum and the magic caused him to transform into a big green swamp monster who was able to control plant life as well as a host of other abilities. One of his powers is to sense human emotion with him having different reactions to different feelings. Fear sends Man-Thing into a fit of rage, and when he senses it, his body automatically secretes a corrosive acid-like agent that will burn anyone he touches. Hence the series tagline, whatever knows fear burns at the Man-Thing's touch. Now, I don't know about you, but if I came across a creature like Man-Thing, it would be difficult not to be afraid. So I really don't know how well I would do, and the idea of being grabbed by such a beast and burned to death because he's mad that I'm afraid sounds like a rough way to go. Number 8, Torn to Shreds. This was a hard one to rank because while I feel like it would be really awful, I also still feel like there's somehow worse out there in the Marvel Universe waiting for me were I a person. Gosh, that would be terrible. I would hope that I was a superhero. That's all. That's the best I can hope, really. Still, this kind of death is pretty much as bad as it gets. If we're speaking in general terms, then, you know, straight up ranking it as one of the worst ways to die in the Marvel multiverse, which is kind of actually what we are doing here. But still, I digress. It's pretty bad. Deadpool is one of the folks who has undergone this usually life ending process multiple times. One such time actually happened when he faced off against Carnage, who actually made a pretty dramatic appearance on our part 2 for this series. Of course, Carnage would take this approach to fighting and probably also immensely enjoy it, which it makes it, I think, that much worse. Now, because this is Deadpool, uh, he didn't die here because Deadpool. However, this wasn't even where everything ended for Deadpool because Carnage also was plotting to burn down the building that this happened in. So Deadpool would have in theory been diced and then kind of flambéed. Number 7, Absorbed by the Hulk. One of the most feared figures in the Marvel Universe for both hero and villain alike is the Incredible Hulk. Despite his reputation as a giant raging green monster, the Hulk goes out of his way to not be responsible for the deaths of any of the civilians or villains that he has to fight while rampaging through the world. Despite this, it does happen from time to time. In the Ultimate Universe, the Hulk is known for eating people, which is of course a terrible way to go, and getting smashed by the Jade Giant would of course be a horrible experience, but I think the worst way that you could meet your end at the hands of the Hulk is the way featured in Immortal Hulk number 8. In this issue, the Hulk has been captured by a secretive black ops organization called Shadow Base. In order to prevent the Hulk from escaping, they have vivisected him into multiple pieces which they keep in separate jars, in order to prevent his healing factor from allowing him to come together and escape. The evil Dr. Clive, who is in charge of the program, is running various cruel experiments on the Hulk in order to fully understand the power of his healing factor. Little did Clive know, he was doing exactly what the Hulk wanted wanted him to. He wanted Clive to run the experiment so that he could learn more about himself, and once he knew what he needed, he controlled his hand in one of the jars to snap its fingers, creating a shockwave that shattered the jars, allowing Hulk's various parts to reform and heal. Hulk took Dr. Clive's treatment personally, and as he reformed, he absorbed the doctor into himself, causing the doctor to be smothered by the Hulk's innards as he desperately begged for mercy that wasn't coming. It is a fitting end for such a character, but it's not a fate I would want to endure while living in the Marvel Universe. Number 6, Ripped in Half. Being ripped in half really does not seem fun, and yet for some reason this is a very common way to die 
when it comes to Marvel Comics. I can't count how many times someone has been ripped in half. I literally can't because every time I attempt to, I actually think of another occurrence of this happening and then I have to start all over again. So it's very hard for me to put a number on that one. It's terrible. Or you know, maybe it's just comics. The one thing I'd really warn against, you know, if you're if you're looking out from us at the Marvel Multiverse is that while living in whatever world you are in, you should basically never do this to another person. Be they villain or hero, regardless of your alignment or their alignment, just don't do it. I've seen this kind of could basically come back to haunt characters who generally also get torn a half by someone else as some kind of like karmic payback. So if you've done it to someone, it's probably coming for you. Number five, Abattoir's family drama. Abattoir was a Gotham villain who believed that by ending the lives of his family members, he could absorb their life forces and become immortal. He went about destroying his family tree, but was frequently thwarted by Batman. During the Nightfall arc, where Bruce Wayne was out of commission due to a broken spine and Jean Paul Valley was the new Batman, Abattoir went after the last living member of his family, Graham Etchison. He put Graham in an elaborate death trap designed to cause Graham as much pain as possible before his death. He put Graham on a bed of nails with a special rig set up that would drop a weight on him every hour or so. With every new weight, Graham would sink deeper into the nails until he would eventually die after several hours. The new Batman went after Abattoir, but was more concerned with punishing evil than he was with protecting innocent lives, and let the villain fall into a vat of molten steel. As a as a result, Abattoir was unable to lead Jean Paul to Graham, and he died a slow and painful death. Number four, Dokken. What's worse than being livestock? Being Dokken's livestock, I guess. If Wolverine is the best at what he does, Dokken is the one who simply enjoys what he does a little too much. Dokken is a trained killer, and we get to see this side of him on full display during his fight against the Punisher during Dark Reign. It was during this era of Marvel that we saw Norman Osborn take over as leader of the Avengers after S.H.I.E.L.D. was no more, and he was basically put in charge of his very own organization, which he named HAMMER, an acronym that stands for well, nothing really. Osborn just liked the sound of it. During this time working for Osborn, the Dark Avengers were given a list of targets for them to remove, them to get rid of. One such person on that list was Frank Castle. This death is also what we call overkill. Dokken not only tears Frank apart and runs him through with his claws multiple times, but in the end, he also removes his head. Of course, Frank wouldn't straight up die, but instead would later return as the undead Frankencastle. But regardless, I still think this would be a terrible way to go. Number three, Miss Arrow. When Spider-Man was killed by Morlin in the Others event, his body was put in a cocoon under the Brooklyn Bridge until he returned to life. He shed his skin, and this skin was taken over by a bunch of spiders who formed a being called Arrow, who was intent on killing Spider-Man once and for all. Arrow began going by Miss Arrow, and she tried to impregnate Flash Thompson with an egg sac that would give birth to thousands of her offspring, but was stopped by a shotgun-wielding Betty Brant. Miss Arrow tried to escape, but Spider-Man man pursued her, eventually managing to force her into the Central Park Zoo's aviary. The various exotic birds were thrilled with the group of spiders before them, and went about eating Miss Arrow one spider at a time as she thrashed and screamed. The birds ate almost every spider, leaving only one left, which Spider-Man promptly stepped on. Number two, Cassandra Nova. Cassandra Nova is definitely someone you don't want to mess with if you're in the Marvel Universe. In fact, you probably just don't even want to meet her. You probably just want to stay far away from her. She's basically the evil twin of Professor X, who is known for being just as powerful as he is, if not more powerful sometimes, and definitely a lot more evil. She has taken people out in a variety of horrible different ways, but I think one of the worst was definitely Donald Trask's ending. I don't even know how to describe what happens to Donald Trask in issue number 150 of the new X-Men. Nova basically copies his DNA and then like phases her hands through him. Although I imagine this is happening psychically or that it's meant to be what's implied here. But with Nova, I mean, you never really know. This could be psychically or it could be physically or it could be both. This could be some kind of telekinetic trick of hers where she literally does manage to put her hands physically through your head to kill you. I mean, Nova's a telepath, not really like a telekinetic, but I would believe if she was like, also I'm that too. I would believe that she just psionically is on a whole other level. Either way, Okay. Ouch. What's worse is she was of course copying Trask's DNA so that she could gain the ability to control and command the Sentinel army. 
Ugh. Number one, Deadpool's counter to the healing factor. On Earth 12,101, the X-Men grew tired of Deadpool's instability and insanity and had him committed to the Ravencroft Asylum, hoping that he would be cured of his madness. Unfortunately, his doctor was really a disguised psycho man who was using his position to try and brainwash insane people into doing his bidding. He took away the voices in Wade's head, but they were replaced by a new voice that was telling Deadpool to kill everyone. He became aware of his status as a fictional puppet and went on a killing spree of everyone in the Marvel Universe, both hero and villain alike. We get detailed accounts of how he kills the various characters in increasingly brutal and twisted ways, with some highlights being him taking out Thor by growing his hammer with pim particles so that Thor is crushed underneath it, or trapping the X-Men in an insane death trap. But out of all the fates he subjects the various characters to, I think the worst is what he does to the characters with healing factors. Being a character with a powerful healing factor, Deadpool is uniquely qualified for taking out other such characters. And as Wolverine discovers when he walks into a trap, Deadpool has it all figured out. He has captured Dokken in X-23 and left them suspended with a computer-controlled flamethrower. The computer keeps track of their vitals, and every time they come back to life and begin to regenerate, the flamethrowers go off and reduce them to skeletons again. So they are trapped in a continuous cycle of being burnt to death, barely coming back to life, and then immediately being burnt to death again, forever. Number 10, shot by a diamond bullet. This is actually a pretty smart way to deal with Emma Frost, but all in all, a pretty dumb way for her to die when you kind of read it on paper. Both like makes sense and doesn't make sense. I mean, Emma Frost has a diamond form, which makes her pretty much indestructible, for the most part anyways. So how does one defeat her when she's in her diamond form? Apparently by exposing the flaw in her diamond form and using the same material to kill her. How do you shatter a diamond? With another diamond, apparently. I don't know if that would actually work, but comic book science. Emma's diamond form is her secondary mutation, and while we've seen many attacks on her defended by this form of hers, apparently a diamond bullet can just insta-shatter her. I mean, I've heard of diamonds cutting diamonds, but never necessarily being used to completely shatter a diamond. If shot at her exact weak point though, apparently this is just what a diamond bullet can do, which is something one of the cuckoos, Esme, knew about and exposed to kill Emma, mind controlling mutant Angel Salvador to carry out the execution. Don't worry though, Jean, while merged with the Phoenix, managed to bring her back with Beast's help. Jean can do anything. Number nine, taken out by the Punisher. Some of the most creative forms of transportation to the afterlife come at the hands of Frank Castle, the Punisher. But at the end of the day, Frank is just one seriously messed up guy. A normal guy with a good chunk of training, a hell of an arsenal, and a little bit of creativity. He is not a match for a lot of the incredibly powerful beings out in Marvel Comics, but somehow we have the Punisher kills the Marvel Universe story. When his family were taken out by being bystanders of a superhero conflict, Frank is given the backing to take out all those who call themselves superheroes. And my god, a lot of these deaths make no sense, because of course they don't. He takes out the Hulk by waiting until he is Bruce Banner again, but that's never how the Hulk has worked in Marvel Comics. He took down Doctor Doom, with his only excuse for winning being that Doom stopped to give a speech, which does kind of make sense, but the worst example comes when he takes on the mutants. By the sheer will of lazy writing and Frank's throwaway explanation of manipulation, all the combined X teams are having their final battle against Magneto, Apocalypse, and their unholy alliance of acolytes and evil mutants on the moon in an air sealed dome, which is where Frank drops a nuke on them, taking them all out. Ignore the fact that a good chunk of those here would be able to survive that kind of attack and we're all good. Number 8. EMP versus Phoenix Force. This has to be one of the most ridiculous ones. The Phoenix is typically known as being an unstoppable, undefeatable entity. I mean, the first time around, the only way that it was able to be defeated was basically by self-sacrifice. However, that hasn't stopped people from somehow banishing it or straight up killing the entity. Case in point, when Magneto defeated Jean Grey as the Phoenix by administering a powerful electromagnetic pulse, which gave her a planetary size stroke. Literally, those are the direct words from the comic. That is some major comic stuff right there. Only in comics would that happen. Number seven, being a part of ecstatics. Lots of deaths in ecstatics were stupid, but that was the point. The whole thing was a bit of a satire on reality TV. The team itself isn't exactly one of the premier mutant teams out in the world, and that's putting it lightly. The members of the team aren't exactly the most impressive. The original team made up of mutants Zeitgeist, who has the power of super puke, Lenui, who has dark force powers, 
Wars, Battering Ram, who was a big purple goat looking man, Plasm, who had liquidy water powers, Gen Genie, who could create earthquakes depending on how much she drank, and Sluck, who was basically a squid. They went by X Force, which, as you may know, shares its name with a much more impressive team. But all those original members, minus three of them who I didn't mention, and Sluck, who was blown up by a tank in South Africa, all got completely decimated in spectacularly embarrassing fashion during a rescue mission to save a pop music boy band named Boys Are Us. Turns out their demise was actually planned by the team's manager, coach, and its leader, Zeitgeist himself, because they thought a team with a constantly changing roster and high body count would gain them fan interest. The team managed to go on with pretty horrible results. There have been 28 members of Ecstatics who have passed away over their history, with only 9 of them surviving. So yeah, don't ever join this team. Number 6. Eaten by Birds Miss Arrow has a pretty wild death in the comics. For those of you who are unfamiliar or haven't heard of her, that is probably because you know her by a different name. The Other. That is right. Miss Arrow is actually the extremely powerful spider totem entity that is linked to Peter Parker's Spider-Man. As such, she is entirely made up of spiders, despite sometimes appearing to be human while under the guise of Miss Arrow. Because of this, she was at one time killed by a bunch of birds who devoured the spiders that made her up, with Peter squishing the final spider that survived the bird attack. This wouldn't be the end of the other though, as one more day messed up the whole continuity thanks to reality being warped, with Peter having actually never accepted the other in this alternate, which is now the main, reality. Number 5. Being Dumb Magneto in the Ultimate Universe was like the bad guy. He was nuts, and he had the power to back it up, which he proved when he used his abilities to offset the magnetic poles, which put the whole world into chaos. Tidal waves in New York, mega flash freezes in Latveria, volcanoes erupting in the Amazon, all that good stuff. Naturally, the survivors were not happy, and they would be coming after Magneto with a vengeance. They aren't dumb, so of course their attack on the villain would be planned out. Right? Well, it doesn't seem like it was. While all the surviving heroes make their assault on Magneto's fortress, the hot-headed Warren Worthington, you know, the guy whose only power is that he has wings, decides that he is going to jump the gun and come full speed blasting through a window, giving Magneto a good old punch to the face. Magneto could have squashed this guy like a bug in one swift move, but he doesn't even think Angel is worth the effort. Instead, he lets Sabretooth, his mad dog, do the deed. Sabretooth pounces on him, rips one of Warren's wings off with his mouth, and then stomps on the mutant's neck, taking him off the board in one page. Idiot. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you love hearing about weird, dumb deaths, well, we have a lot of weird things for you on our weirdest playlist, so go check that out. It's full of weirdness. Number 4. Waking up Fin Fang Foom. Something you shouldn't ever do? Wake up a sleeping dragon, as Jerry Carpenter learned in Hulk vs. Fin Fang Foom issue number one, which admittedly is a pretty wild and weird story, so if you're into that, you should go check it out. Here, as promised, the two beings end up fighting, but first, we're treated to a story clearly inspired by John Carpenter's The Thing. Probably also why this guy's named Jerry Carpenter. You see, see what's happening here? Except Fin Fang Foom is the shapeshifter in this tale. For those who don't know, Fin Fang Foom is actually an alien whose race is actually known for their shapeshifting abilities. I feel like not a lot a lot of people think about that, but that is a thing. Needless to say, Jerry finds Foom below the ice and sends for the rest of his team up in the Arctic. They're basically like a research team, but instead of just waiting, he is hasty to proceed because he basically wants to name this newfound finding of what he believes is an undiscovered type of dinosaur after himself. He smashes through the ice with a pick, only to awaken Foom. Foom blasts forth and takes Carpenter for his host basically wearing him like a skin suit. The really weird thing though is I think this is the only case of Foom like actually needing to do this. He claims he's attempting to rebuild his strength by merging with hosts and is like looking for a real strong host when he runs into the Hulk, but I don't think he's ever actually needed to do that before or after this point ever again. And he can just shapeshift on his own. He doesn't actually need a human host to turn into a human, so there's a lot of weird stuff happening in this comic. But hey, if you gotta make Hulk and Foom fight, I guess you gotta do some weird stuff. Number three, falling on Rogue. Nothing stands up to falling on a woman who leeches life away, unable to pick herself up. Well, falling isn't the right word. It was more like Mr. Sinister was held down. Following the events of M-Day, a mutant named Hope Summers is born, bringing hope to the mutant species. Well, Mr. Sinister, he reassembled the Marauders and planned to control the future of mutant kind by stealing Hope. Sinister knew this and wanted to use Hope to control the mutant population 
Foundation because the mutants can't just have something without a villain trying to mess it all up. Sinister regrouped his marauders alongside Mystique, who knew that hope was necessary to save her daughter, Rogue, uh, from her out of control powers. Well, Sinister failed to capture hope, and like an idiot, he informs Mystique that he is unable to help her save Rogue. Safe to say that Mystique doesn't appreciate that very much. She grabs and shoves Sinister's face onto the unconscious Rogue, and unable to get up, his life is sucked away. Now I'll admit, it's a little bit awesome, but in the massive gallery of villains losing their life, it's arguably one of the lamest ones. Imagine Sinister having to tell people about this one when he eventually returns. Embarrassing. Number two, turned into a sundae. I don't actually know if Ice Cream died here, but it certainly seems to be implied that he did. I'm just, at least to me it does. This is the canon that lives in my mind. Ice Cream was a character who could turn into ice cream. Hence his name, Ice Cream, Ice Cream, get it? He infiltrated the expansion in the first and only issue of Obnoxio the Clown. Speaking of weird comics, that's another one. He wanted revenge on the X-Men because they had cooler mutant powers than he did. Although how he really planned to get said revenge and beat them when his powers only allowed him to turn into ice cream, I'm not really sure. He attempted to turn the danger room on the students, but this plan ended up failing with Professor X lowering the temperature of the control room to below freezing, which caused Ice Cream to freeze solid. At the end of the story, Obnoxio the Clown decorates Ice Cream as a giant sundae, while Ice Cream's fate is left ultimately undetermined. We never see him again, and it's possible that he literally could have met his end by being mistaken and consumed as actual ice cream at some point later in his life, so yeah. Number one, just take off the quiver. A lot of the time when a hero's light goes out, it will be in an ultimate display of self-sacrifice, throwing themselves into impossible circumstances in order to save the majority. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, that kind of thing. It's the number one heroic move, but it only really works when there is absolutely no other option. When looking at Hawkeye's sacrifice in Avengers Disassembled, there were a whole handful of other options, and most of them were pretty obvious, making for a heroic self-sacrifice that just ended up coming across as incredibly dumb and unnecessary. Basically, Wanda Maximoff has gone completely bonkers and turned on the Avengers, but none of them know that just yet. She's already caused the passing of both Vision and Scott Lang Ant-Man, and all the Avengers have assembled in order to figure out what the heck was happening. Using her Hex powers, she created a Kree warship to show up out of nowhere and go on the attack. Hawkeye runs off to go get some more arrows, and when he comes back, he goes off, taking out Kree left, right, and center until he is hit in his explosive arrow quiver by an energy weapon. With his quiver on fire and set to explode, instead of just taking it off or firing off the arrows, Hawkeye grabs a Kree with a jetpack and blasts off into the warship, blowing both it and himself clean off the battlefield. Just sit. Number 10, Dark Beast. I think the worst thing about being killed by Dark Beast would be the fact that he would likely do everything in his power to actually, like, not kill you which sounds counterintuitive to this list, but just go with me. He would just keep you alive while he subjects you to terrible biological experiments, which sounds pretty awful. Dark Beast is the alternate version of Hank McCoy of the X-Men who hails from Earth 295. Here, he is not a member of the X-Men, but one of Apocalypse's lead geneticists and allies. Earth 295 is basically an alternate reality where Apocalypse successfully conquered the Earth, spinning out of the Age of Apocalypse event and follow-up line. I would at least say that Age of Apocalypse kind of became a comic line afterwards because although the timeline kind of got fixed, it continued to go on. Dark Beast tends to focus more on experimenting on folks to improve them or simply to learn more about them. Also, improve them. According to Dark Beast, their improvements. However, he isn't as morally sound as Earth 616 Hank is, which is why you wouldn't want to become his victim. Although, right now, Beast of Earth 616, the main continuity, feels like he's kind of becoming more and more like his darker AOA counterpart. Honestly, being killed by Dark Beast would be terrible because it would likely be long and drawn out. And in the end, the dying would actually probably feel like a relief in comparison to everything else that you went through leading up to it. And friends, before I move on to my next spot on this list, if you love when we talk about some of the worst things to have happened in comics, you should check out our Worst Things That Happened playlist. We have one of those. Go check it out. Click the thing somewhere over here. 
Number 9, Statuified. While in her current series, The Scarlet Witch, Wanda Maximoff has not been killing anyone, she has been coming in hot with pretty epic punishments for the malicious villains who have crossed her path. In issue number 1, she actually ends up dealing with Corruptor, who she does not kill but does severely punish by turning him into stone. And even if he does get to live as a statue in the town, that's not really living. Is it? In fact, initially, the town the corruptor had tormented wanted to completely destroy him by smashing him in his statue form to little pieces. However, Wanda is the voice of reason here who cautions them against acting on vengeful impulses. Wanda kind of being like, look, I've lived that life. I wouldn't recommend. Still, we don't know what happened here. So, I mean, he could be dead because Wanda's like, look, it's up to you. I wouldn't do it. Bye. So they could have done it afterwards. And if he was killed this way, what a way to go. Though I imagine it's more likely that we'll see him return later in in the series after having somehow escaped his stone prison to seek revenge on Wanda for trapping him there because I mean that's just how comics usually go so I'd be surprised if it doesn't happen but you know I could be wrong. Number 8 Impaled. Shout out to Eric Curse in the comments on our part 3 for this one. Sugar Man is a character I hadn't thought of for some time but being killed by him would certainly not be fun. He is another mad geneticist type, my, my favorite kind of villain. Definitely not a villain I'd ever want to run into, mad geneticist types. Except for, I would say, Mr. Sinister. I think I could actually maybe befriend Mr. Sinister at least. But as I said, in general, these are usually the worst when it comes to meeting your end. And like some others on our list, Sugar Man is pretty fond of impaling. Sugar Man does this in issue number four of Generation Next with his tongue, actually killing one of his own guards, Quietus, when he suspects that someone is attempting to basically infiltrate his power station. Sugar Man hails from the reality known as Age of Apocalypse, aka Earth-295, but he eventually makes his way to the main reality of Earth-616. Number 7, Whispers. Black Bolt is someone you probably never want to get too close to if you were in the Marvel Universe. Unless you were someone who was completely certain they were safe from ever angering Black Agar, I guess. And then again, you'd still probably want to be a little cautious considering that Black Bolt could sneeze and accidentally kill you. Especially if you were a squishy human, as both you and I are right now. Or are we? Well, I'm assuming you're a human. If you're you're an alien or a mutant, leave an alien or there's no mutant emojis, leave an X emoji in the comments so we can get a clear sense for how many off world nerds and how many mutant nerds we have watching this video right now. Black Bolt has merely gone up to someone, whispered into their ear, and obliterated them in the past. And I gotta be honest, it doesn't sound like the most pleasant way to go. It doesn't sound like the most pleasant way to go. Haha. <laughs> I didn't even realize I did that, but. There it is. Pun, pun accidental, but intended for sure. Number six, kissed goodbye and tossed into the sun. That was how The Void went and issue number eight of the second volume of Sentry. The Void is basically the dark reflection of Robert Reynolds' Sentry. Sentry is a superhero from Marvel whose powers make him comparable to Superman in terms of the sheer strength he possesses. He is said to have the power of one million burning suns, but apparently it only took one sun to defeat The Void, at least this time around. The Void, of course, would return because he's kind of like always gonna come back in some way. Still, I think getting thrown into the sun after being kissed goodbye by your good alter ego is a pretty wild way to go. Also, would that not be terrible for you as the sentry? We don't see it on panel, but like I kind of have to imagine it would feel a little bit like burning half of yourself away as the void is meant to represent the darker side and temptation of Bob's power. Sentry is both sentry and the void, so. Yeah. Also, what would that fight look like if you were just like watching it in space? Does it just look like the sentry like fighting himself? <laughs> probably not. It's probably like an actual shadow entity, but it would be kind of funny if it was him fighting himself. Number five, shallow water. Oh boy, this is not just a terrible way to go in terms of physically what is happening here, but also in terms of the emotional stakes that are involved in this one. We're talking about the death of Dawkin. I know in part three of this series, we talked about how awful it would be to be killed by Dawkin, but at the same time, this story kind of makes me feel for him. Dawkin is the son of Wolverine, who was basically manipulated into hating and resenting his dad since he was a kid. At one point, the two are pitted against one another by Sabretooth, and Wolverine is forced to take him out, using one of a few weaknesses that both he and his son share. Water. Ugh. Wolverine drowns Dokken in a puddle as we get a vision, a dream, if you will, of what life could have been like were Dokken actually raised by his biological parents, Logan and Itsu. This death wouldn't stick, and now we know Dokken as the anti-hero Akahiro, his given name, but that doesn't make it any less tragic or awful. 
this was still a pretty terrible thing that happened. Number four, Heartless. So admittedly, the way Magneto went was pretty epic, but at the same time, sounds like it would be immensely painful and stressful for you to be in his shoes. Magneto ended up being permakilled, or at least permakilled for now, I guess we could say. Might be forever, but probably just for now. On Mars, aka planet Araco, while helping to defend the planet and its Iraqi mutant population against Uranus. Or at least that was the beginning of his end, I should say. Uranus ripped out Magneto's heart and left him for dead, but through sheer will, Eric used his master of magnetism powers to keep his blood pumping through his body and ended up continuing on. He even got in a rematch with Uranus with a shockingly fantastic assist from Storm. Oh. Such a good moment. In the end, Uranus was defeated, but Magneto was left dead. I can't even imagine fighting Uranus on a good day, never mind doing it while heartless and maintaining my own life support. Also, if you missed when this happened, you want to go check out AXE Judgment Day or Axe Judgment Day, which is also a pretty fun event, I will say. I enjoyed it. Number three, becoming Ultron. If you've been watching Top 10 Nerd and the content I make over here for a while, then you'll likely know that one of my biggest fears is possession. <laughs> so needless to say, this is one that gets me. For this demise, we're talking about the complete eradication of Hank Pym, which is awful, especially in the sense that when it happened, we didn't even really understand that Pym had actually died. Hank Pym at one point ends up being merged with his evil creation, Ultron. Ultron forces the two of them to merge together and something new is made. This hybrid being identified as Ultron Pym, and for a while we actually believed that this entity was both Hank and Ultron together. However, we later learn in the Tony Stark Iron Man series that Hank had actually died when this happened and that the version of him that seemed to exist still within Ultron Pym was actually nothing more than a simulation. In other words, Ultron Pym is just Ultron walking around in like a Hank Pym skin suit, which is horrifying to think about. Number two, Sabretooth. While Dokken and the U-Men are both pretty terrible, if there was one person I wouldn't want to be killed by in the Marvel Universe, it would probably be Sabretooth. Victor Creed is probably one of the most vicious and evil characters we have in the Marvel Universe. Sure, he's done some heroic stuff before, mainly when his alignment was flipped or if we're talking about alternate realities, but this is a man who legitimately revels in violence usually. When he was sent to the pit in Krakoa as punishment, he used this time to kill all the X-Men and heroes he felt had ever slighted him. In his dreams, of course. This wasn't real, but it was still pretty brutal. And when that was done, he decided to create his own hell, and then plot his own escape, even double-crossing the prisoners that he had planned his escape with. Yeah, Creed has to be one of the worst ways to go, hands down. Number one, Dire Wraith. Big thanks to Cannon Ranger for this suggestion. Goodness, are Dire Wraiths frightening? Touche. These creatures basically assimilate you, allowing them to adapt to your shape and even absorb your knowledge and memories that you've gained throughout your time living. They do this by piercing your skull with their barbed tongue and basically sucking all that knowledge and brain juice out of your noggin. In the process, you shrivel and pretty quickly die. Yikes. I don't know about you, but this is not a way that I would like to go. I feel like the idea of anyone sticking their tongue into my skull just yeah, that sounds nasty in like the worst way possible. This also really plays on my fear of possession because after killing you, the dire wraith can then kind of like adopt your form and then use it to get close to your loved ones and, you know, possibly also kill them, which would terrify me in my last moments of life to think about that. All right, kicking off the list at number 10 is Robin. Why not kick off this list at the beginning? The inciting incident for our protagonist. In both the show and the comic book, we pick up with Huey Campbell, who isn't exactly the pillar of his community, when he is out and about with his girlfriend, Robin. In the show, Huey and Robin are walking along the street when Robin accidentally winds up on the street and gives Huey a kiss. In the comic, Huey and Robin are at a fair when they share their kiss and are all lovey and giddy and all that good romantic stuff. But in both instances, the happy moment is brought to an incredibly abrupt end when Robin is completely obliterated thanks to the superhero known as A-Train. For the show, A-Train himself runs straight through Robin, causing both him and Huey to be completely covered in Robin's soup. In the comic, A-Train and a supervillain were doing some super speed battle when the villain was rammed straight into Robin and then a brick wall, moving at about Mach 3. In both instances, Huey is left hanging onto Robin's detached forearms. 
At least it was quick. Number nine, disfigured and discarded. I think one of the worst ways to go in the comics is actually Vicor's implied death. Although we don't see it on panel, the soup known as Mighty Warrior is used by Butcher to gain information on the Scorchers. How does Butcher convince Vicor to join him? By visiting him at his wife Norska's funeral and throwing him into the cremation oven next to her remains. While left horribly disfigured by this incident right afterwards, Vicor surprisingly survives thanks to his superhuman durability and even manages to heal most of his face. In the end, once Butcher has no more use of him, it's implied that he basically takes Mighty Warrior out to the forest in the guise of a secret meeting to dispose of him. Brutal. I just can't believe that Butcher did this at, you know, Mighty Warrior's wife's funeral. Like, I know Vicor wasn't too broken up about it because of what happens in that comic, or at least, you know, he seemed to move on pretty quickly, but still. Then again, this is Butcher, so I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. Number eight, Head Pop. In the boys' TV show, there is a character named Victoria Nadia Newman, who becomes a pretty major antagonist, whereas the character she is based on, Victor Newman, in the comics, is just the guy who becomes vice president. The thing about Victoria, unlike Victor, is she is actually, spoiler alert, a soup. With the inflexible ability to make people's heads completely pop in a small explosion of disgustingness. Using this ability, she has been able to take out Susan Rayner, Jonah Vogelbaum, Alastair Adana, and several other members of Congress. Now, just like Robin, you know, at least this is quick. But it's not exactly a demise I would wish on anyone. I can't imagine the pain of having your head explode would be light. And because it's so quick, the rest of your body would have to like catch up to what just happened. And the idea of that is not sitting well with me in my tummy. Number seven, sneeze. Many of these for me are going to be from the boys live action series because they're just so brutal and so visual and I just love the live action series so much. Once you see a lot of these, it's hard to get them out of your head. Case in point, in season three of the show, when Peter, Termite's love interest, is killed. Termite shrinks down to do something that I probably can't talk about here on YouTube. Let's just say it's something Peter very much enjoys. However, during this intimate moment between them, while Termite is shrunk down and literally inside of Peter's body, Termite sneezes. This causes Termite to unintentionally lose control of his powers momentarily, which can happen when he sneezes, changing back to his normal size. Well, I think you can see where I'm going with this one. If you have also watched season three, which I hope you have if you're watching this video, then I'm sure this was also a moment that forever stuck out in your mind. Number six, Pop Claw. This part is kind of twofold. A Train in the show seems like one of the only redeemable members of the seven, outside of Starlight, obviously. Well, A Train was once on a team called Teenage Kicks with Pop Claw, a Wolverine inspired soup, and his secret girlfriend. Pop Claw was involved in one of these show's most heinous deaths when she accidentally crushes her landlord with her legs while they were doing the deed, if you know what I mean. That one was pretty shocking to watch, but Popclaw herself also suffered a pretty upsetting passing. Popclaw has a pretty damaged reputation. A-Train was so insecure about this, especially in the eyes of Homelander, that when he saw her as a liability, he took her life by giving her a substance overdose. It was pretty horrible to watch and makes me wonder how the hell they are planning to redeem A-Train going forward. Also, it's very real. Number five, biting your own tongue. Sounds like a weird way to put it, but that is in essence what happened to Stormfront in the end. Or at least what we were told happened to her. I'm pretty sure it's what happened, but you know. She took her own life by biting off her tongue. While I'm still a little skeptical of this, as you know, we don't see her body or the act in question, I do believe that Stormfront at this point was extremely depressed, and so it does make sense that she would, you know, take this out. And also, we do at least, you know, see where she was when it happened. She ends up dying on Homelander's birthday, which causes him to have a straight up diabolical reaction to a woman threatening to jump off the building, who throughout the course of their conversation basically changes her mind. He's supposed to save her because it's his birthday save. I personally think, although Stormfront seemed to deserve her death and that it definitely felt karmic to me, that this would still be a pretty terrible way to go. Number four, Timothy. The Deep in the show is pretty much the most pathetic hero of the seven. He might not be as pure, evil, and maniacal as Homelander, but he's still done some incredibly horrible things that are not redeemable at all. The only thing close to being redeemable is his care for aquatic animal life, which is still uncomfortable because he has some really deep relationships with some of his aquatic life, pun intended. Anyways, 
like his relationship with Timothy the Octopus. This relationship is brought to an incredibly bad end. Basically, Homelander forces the Deep to eat Timothy alive during a dinner with Ashley and his once upon a time wife, Cassandra. I believe it was Homelander trying to make Deep conform with the rest of humanity, which isn't really an excuse because Timothy was an innocent character, and as we know, octopuses, octopi, are incredibly smart. So to see Timothy killed off to show Homelander's cruelty and the Deep's cowardice was pretty horrific. The Deep slurping down his friend alive was made even worse when he said that Timothy was crying. It was all CGI, sure, and people love to eat octopus, but this is just awful. Number three, made to jump. Speaking of terrible deaths, while Stormfront's demise definitely sounds pretty bad, I think the woman who was there with Homelander when he heard about it, Chelsea, had it a lot worse. She was the one who was threatening to jump off a building when Homelander flew to her rescue. At first, his tactic was basically to convince her there was really no point of jumping because if Chelsea jumped, he'd just fly down and catch her before her body hit the pavement. Basically, it was all futile, he said, so she might as well just like give it up. However, after learning of Stormfront's death, which by the way, happens on Homelander's birthday, Homelander refuses to accept that Chelsea's life matters more than that of the woman he loved. And even when Chelsea begs to be let go and actually changes her mind, recanting on her initial conviction to jump, Homelander basically pushes her off the roof. All right, in at number two, Homelander. Okay, so spoilers for the boys comic book series, which finished in 2012. What was arguably the biggest twist of the comic came near the end of the story. In issue number 65 specifically. Luckily, this twist is not present in the show, so you don't need to worry about this, but it turns out that Black Noir is secretly a Homelander clone. He was created with the whole purpose of being meant to take Homelander down if he ever loses control. Problem is, Homelander enjoys being a puppet of Vought International, and that puts Homelander well in their good graces, so Homelander never ends up going rogue. This makes Black Noir incredibly frustrated, as he has been looking for the day when he'll finally fulfill his purpose of bringing down Homelander, only to never be given it for years and years and years. In the final issues of The Boys, after slowly watching Homelander get more and more insane, he finally snaps and attacks the White House, taking out the President. This finally opened up Black Noir to finally do what he was made to finally do when he showed up to the White House in the climactic issue 65, revealing himself as a clone and then going for an absolute slog fest against the completely shocked Homelander. They ripped each other to shreds, but Black Noir came out on top before he stepped out onto the front lawn, missing significant chunks of his body. That is when the US military, alongside Billy Butcher, brought this insane soup to his brutal end with one final blow from Billy Butcher's crowbar and brain crushing fist. Number one, pulverized. I I don't really know how else to describe what happened to Supersonic. He was the ex of Starlight, who was originally known by the name Drummer Boy, a member of the all superhero band Super Sweet. He and Starlight once dated and were friends, as we saw during his time on American Hero. American Hero was basically a reality TV show that Vought used to recruit their newest member of the seven after Stormfront was, of course, removed from the team. Alex, under the codename Supersonic, ended up winning and joined Starlight in a plot to basically try and take down Homelander. However, he made a mistake in trying to recruit A Train to their side, who basically ratted out Alex and Annie to Homelander. As punishment, Homelander ended up killing Alex brutally to the point that when he revealed Alex's corpse to Starlight, Alex was pretty much almost unrecognizable, save for his suit. His limbs and body were basically torn asunder, and his face was just pretty much gone. Honestly, can't wait to see how the show tries to top things again from the previous season. You'll probably regret saying. That. But until next time, thank you so much for watching on Top 10 Nerd. I'm Amanda McKnight. And I'm Adam Andrews, and we will catch you all on the Flippy Flop. Peace out, nerds. Bye. Atrian's such a good character. The only other one that you didn't mention was I was gonna say Queen Maeve, I feel like is redeemable. Queen Maeve gets redemption. Oh, that's upsetting. That's alright. I said you can keep this in if you want. Yeah. I'll I said slide it. Queen Maeve. I'll sell that one.